want to start with a basic question of how did we get to the place where we are right now, where so many are questioning multilateralism, just on its face? How many are questioning the rules-based international economic order that we've known? How many are questioning the World Trade Organization, the institution that's at the heart of our trading system? You know, it's been setting the rules of the road since 1947 in the GATT and certainly since 1995. And yet we're at a place now where the United States seems to be fairly willing to kick the WTO under the proverbial bus, or at least not to do very much to save it. Why? I mean, how? And what comes of that? And that's a lot of what I want to talk about. Um, I think for me, when I step back and look at it, why? I think there's five reasons. Um, and I'm going to start with the one where I think Mark Wu was talking about yesterday, which is the rise of China. Uh, there's no question that um, this was, as, as David Otter so carefully put it, you know, a shock to the system. Um, and at some level, it stems from the notion that the WTO has failed, has not been able to curb the kind of practices that China is engaging in, has not been able to police the unfairnesses that are perceived to come from China. And if the, United, if the WTO can't do that, then what's it worth? is clearly one of the questions. The other issue for the WTO is this perception by many in the world of, wait a minute, what is this? The two largest trading countries in the world are having this basic trade war, the United States and China, in essence, engaging in a trade war outside of the WTO. Again, what's the point of having a World Trade Organization if all of the trade fights aren't going to take place and aren't going to be resolved within the WTO system? So I think that's one of the things that's contributing. The second is a lot of what was also talked about in this conference is this erasing of the line between economic security and national security. For years, all of us that worked in the trade realm, in the sort of economic realm, we stayed in our lane, and all of our friends over in the Defense Department and the military establishment, they stayed in their lane, and we all knew where the line was drawn. That's gone. Uh, again, we, we no longer have a system in which it's really clear uh, what is national security and what is economic security. For the Biden administration, though, this is becoming a little bit tricky. Because if, on the one hand, they are saying, we want to join with our allies and partners, we've revitalized NATO, we are going to work with everyone on national security issues, we're going to have an alliance on national security, and then you come over, and what are they doing on the economic side? America first. Buy American. Everything made in America. We're going to reshore. Uh, so that is sort of language, behavior, uh, issues that are very off-putting to many of our same allies that we're trying to be allied with on the national security side and a violation of the WTO rules. So again, a huge push on, on where we end up. Third for me, in terms of what's kind of undermining a little bit of our, our faith in the WTO, is what I'd call the rise of regionalism. And I put up here a, a recent book by one of my colleagues at the Council on Foreign Relations, Shannon O'Neill, has written that really focuses in on, it's not globalization that's been happening, it's regionalization. Um, and really looking at why many of the things that drove uh, this perception of globalization have really changed. I mean, if you think about it, an awful lot of that movement to go make things in China or other places, was driven by the desire to get cheap labor. Well, with automation, don't need as much labor. Uh, with automation, all, again, not as much of reason to go so far afield in order to get uh, your work done. You've also seen a real change in consumers wanting fast, tailored goods. They don't want, again, those goods that were mass produced in millions of the same thing being made in China. You've also seen a whole lot of countries recognize uh, that globalization uh, has a huge number of risks with vulnerable supply chains, so better to come closer to home. Uh, and what you've really seen is the rise of three regions, Asia, the European, Europe, and North America, with a huge amount of all of the trade occurring within those regions. In Asia alone, 60% of the trade is intra-Asian trade. So when we start talking about let's deglobalize from, or I'm sorry, uh, pull out of China, decouple from China, 
That also means decoupling from all of the other Asian countries. If it's 60% of all the trade is intra-Asia, you can't just pull out of China without effectively pulling out of a significant degree of the rest of, of, the rest of Asia. So again, a lot of reasons why regional and regional trade and regional agreements are becoming more important than WTO or global. Fourth reason for me is um, a lot more willingness to question what is the point of the WTO? Have trade agreements been bad for America? And again, a real rejection of a lot of what Doug Irwin started us off with. Um, are the rules of sort of comparative advantage still holding? Is there a real raison d'etre of trade policy with an efficient division of labor? And again, a much greater willingness um, to blame, if you will, all things foreign for whatever the ills are. Schools aren't as good as they used to be. Roads are crumbling. Blame. Blame foreign goods, so stop imports. Blame foreign people, so stop allowing immigrants. Blame foreign money, so let's screen out foreign investment. That rhetoric, again, has become much more common, much more, much more uh, possible. Um, and again, you, you see this in this notion of, wait a minute, trade has resulted in, again, this is our, our USTR, concentration of wealth, fragile supply chains, uh, the decimation of manufacturing communities. So much greater willingness to say, we reject the, the basic notions of, of why do we trade. The last one for me is, again, a, a, a really growing perception that the World Trade Organization, the WTO, is simply not fit for purpose. Um, that it's reached only two agreements since 1995, so it's not doing a good job of engaging in new trade agreements. The US has become completely fed up with its dispute settlement system. So people like me are not being appointed to the appellate body anymore. There are no members of the appellate body, which means fundamentally you can't bring a complaint and be assured that you're gonna get a binding result. Because what countries do, they, get, they, they go to a panel, the panel says, you're in violation of your rules. And the, and the party on the other side says, okay, fine, I'll appeal it. Appeal it to no one, because there's no one sitting on the appellate body, and yet under the rules of the WTO, you cannot ask to actually move on that. You cannot, in essence, get your winnings. You cannot insist on compliance with a decision while an appeal is pending. While an appeal is pending, you're supposed to do nothing but wait for the appeal to be decided, and with no members of the appellate body, that appeal will pend forever. So again, huge issues that the WTO is simply not fit for purpose. So what do we do about it? Um, and what I, I'm an eternal optimist. So what I am gonna try to make the case for this morning is that what we need to do now is to embrace a new approach to trade policy. An approach that a, co a colleague of mine, Nicholas Lamp, who's written a fantastic book called Six Spaces of Globalization, Who Wins, Who Loses, and Why It Matters, has dubbed multi-purpose trade policy. It's a concept I've been exploring uh, with my students at Georgetown Law School in a series we're calling Erasing the And, that tries to reimagine a trading system in which a lot of the issues that used to be considered completely ancillary, climate change, global health, labor, inclusion, inequality, and move those into the center of the trading system. What would that trading system look like? Uh, and that's kind of what I wanna explore a little bit with you this morning. Um, I will say for sure this is not a new concept, that trade needs to somehow embrace these other issues. Uh, I mean, in, in the run-up to the conclusion of the Uruguay round that led to the WTO, um, and quite prominently at a number of trade ministerial meetings thereafter, this one happens to be from what was referred to as the battle in Seattle, um, a trade ministerial meeting in Seattle in which you know, there were just huge protests um, it was one of my many experiences of getting tear gassed. Um, oh, and again, a lot of the protests over the lack of environmental issues, such as protection of the sea turtles, uh, over you know, uh, concerns over deforestation, over labor issues with you know, workers and unions joining you know, the throngs, lining the streets, complaining um, about corporate greed, about the WTO, uh, et cetera. So, We've had these protests. This is, 19, this is 1997, 1997, 1998. Um, so again, we've had this objection. So why now? Why now bring all of these issues into the trading system? And for me, I think what's different now is really the sense of urgency. 
uh, the, the COVID pandemic brought a realization of how, how dangerous it is to become overly reliant um, on trading partners that you cannot trust to continue to trade with you um, when times get tough. I mean, when everybody starts to say, as minute the COVID panic hits, I'm closing my doors, I'm hoarding my stuff for me, I'm keeping my PPE, no, I won't trade with you anymore. Uh, we all realized how incredibly dangerous that was. You then think about Russia's invasion of Ukraine and what it has done to food security around the world, with Ukraine being one of the largest suppliers of wheat and corn to much of the developing world, you start to see, wait a minute, the system cannot work like this um, if, if, again, when in times of crisis, um, things, things really go so far awry. So again, I think a real sense of urgency um, that we've got to move on to some of these other issues. Um, and again, there's a whole lot of them, uh, of issues that now need to be brought into the trade tent. But for this morning, I'm gonna touch on three that I think are really important. One is climate change, one is labor, and one is gender. So let me just start with climate change. Uh, and this comes from at least my own conviction. We simply cannot move far enough and fast enough to fight climate change unless we marry trade tools to the fight. Um, and I've put up here a whole lot of ideas about what, how, how and what trade tools are we talking about that could be used in this, <clears throat> excuse me, in this climate change fight. Everything, tariffs on imported products, Rules of origin could be used to reshape supply chains so that we uh, import products that have less carbon. Quotas or bans on imports that are, that are really a direct threat to the climate. Disciplines on subsidies. So there are a whole series of trade tools that we could really think about that could move the needle on climate change. Um, I'm gonna start with the one that's the most likely to, that is going to happen. Um, in October of this year, the European Union is going to start imposing what is referred to as a Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, or CBAM. So the European Union has had for many years an emissions trading system where it asks all of its big, uh, its big producers of, of energy-intensive, greenhouse gas-intensive products to get cleaner. And if they cannot get cleaner, they have to buy an emissions trading certificate in order to continue to be able to produce and, and pump out all of these greenhouse gases. And now the European Union is saying, we're gonna apply those same charges, those same amounts of payments to all the imports that are coming in that are highly carbon intensive. Iron, steel, fertilizer, cement, other things are gonna now be subjected to this carbon border adjustment. And the whole idea is, if we put a tax on everybody else producing carbon intensive goods, it will create an incentive for them to become less carbon intensive uh, because you don't want to pay uh, this, this border adjustment coming into Europe. So again, it's one of, one of the tools, use tariffs um, on, on these products as a way to fight climate change. Another one uh, that is getting a lot more discussion is the idea of putting labels on goods. I mean, if you had a label on a bottle of Fiji water that showed you that because it has to be put into a really heavy plastic container and shipped all the way from Fiji, it has X amount of, of GHGs in it, as opposed to a local bottle of water in a, in a cardboard box that has 10 times less greenhouse gases in it, would that move the needle if every consumer really could understand how much greenhouse gases is your choice um, in, in terms of fighting climate change. So again, labeling is another one of, of the issues that, that we can talk about. Another issue that is clearly coming up in the trade realm is whether or not we can use the tools of the WTO. And here, the WTO is really good at thinking about international standards. How do we get everybody in the tent to think about something? And one of the things that everybody needs to start thinking about is just this basic issue of how do we measure? Can we agree on how to measure? We've known since, since the UNFCC, since the climate change you know, came about, we've had standards that measure nationally in the United States under the IPCC. How much greenhouse gases do the United States produce last year, this year, et cetera? How much does every country do? We have standards for that. We also have standards at the individual corporate level. And increasingly now, our Securities and Exchange Commission requires corporations to report how much GHGs did they produce over the entire life of the company, over all of their products. That's great. But now I want to know how much greenhouse gases is in one ton of steel coming in. How much greenhouse gases is in one bottle of Fiji water? No standards to do that. Um, to the extent that we've looked at them, 
uh, one, one study I saw, uh, we looked under the European Union system, one ton of steel, it said there were 0.8 tons of greenhouse gases in that one ton of steel. Come over and look then under what California is doing. California has an emissions trading system. The California Air Resources Board uh, imposes this. Under the California Air Resources Board standards, this exact same ton of steel would, would register under their system at 3.3 tons of greenhouse gases. So a huge difference in just one ton of steel. So one of the things that is happening now at the WTO is to try to say, we need some standards, because otherwise we're gonna all start fighting with each other. If you say the tax is X and I say it's Y, and what we're fighting over is how much GHGs and how do we measure them. Again, we, we need to come to these international standards. The other tool that is clearly coming to the fore at the WTO is, what can we do to police the amount of fossil fuels? Again, WTO rules already have a category of prohibited subsidies. And if a subsidy falls into the prohibited category, the rule is clear. Members may not um, impose them or maintain them. You cannot do that if it's considered a prohibited subsidy. So again, a huge idea is let's move fossil fuel subsidies into the category of prohibited and start disciplining them, start phasing them out, start saying you cannot impose or maintain. $430 billion in subsidies for, for fossil fuels measured only by government outlays. This is one way to measure it. If you, you may have seen numbers out there, uh, others, the International Monetary Fund looks at the, if you will, cost to the planet of fossil fuel subsidies. Number last year, $5.7 trillion cost to the planet from fossil fuel subsidies. Got to get serious about it. And one of the ways is maybe to look at trade tools. The trick in fossil fuel subsidies is going to be this one. You might get international agreement to say we should cut back on the production subsidies, the subsidies that go to the Exxons and the mobiles of the world for exploration, et cetera, a lot of tax breaks and other things. Maybe you would say the world should agree to that. But look at the big green box, 86% of the subsidies go to help people lower the cost of their heating oil, their gasoline, et cetera, consumption subsidies. Those are gonna be politically much harder, uh, I think, to get some kind of agreement for, for what to do about them. All right, so moving on from, from, from climate change, you know, one of the other big areas where there is a sense that trade rules could make a difference in another area is in the space of labor and human rights. And we're already seeing it. Um, already in the United States now, we have passed the Uyghur Forced Labor Protection Act, which says that because of the amount of forced labor in, in, in the Xinjiang region, that red region up there um, in China, that goods that are coming out of Xinjiang and or made with forced labor are gonna be subject to bans in the United States. The European Union is getting ready to do the same thing. That's gonna hugely affect cotton, solar, other things that we heavily source coming out of that Xinjiang region. And again, in the trading system, it creates all of these difficulties, again, that the trading system has to deal with. How do you know the cotton that was in Xinjiang that then got spun in another place, that then got woven in another place, that then got knit into a shirt in another place? How do we trace it all the way back to Xinjiang if we're gonna make these labor bans effective? Um, the other issue on labor, I put this up there because this is one of these really complicated charts, but it's a new development. In the United States, Mexico, Canada agreement, USMCA, USMACA, as someone described it, the NAFTA, the new NAFTA, there's something really unique in what is referred to as a rapid response mechanism that allows you to go into an individual facility and say, at this particular plant, the right for workers to organize, the right for workers to unionize and bargain is being denied. And therefore, if this has all been shown through this very complicated process, nonetheless, you can then say, okay, those, imp those products out of that particular facility may no longer be imported into the United States. Again, three cases or four cases already so far. So we are coming up with trade tools to address things like human rights and labor violations. The third one I'm gonna touch on is gender. Um, where, again, we are seeing a huge push now to consider the impact um, that gender will have on, on, um, on women in particular and how essential it is to bring women into the conversation, 
to bring women into the table as negotiators, I will say, to bring women and women's issues um, to the fore. And, and the trouble is what we're seeing in a huge amount of data coming out of the World Bank and other places about what a difference it would make. What a difference it would make, $28 trillion, 26% increase in the GDP of the world if men and women were simply treated equally if women weren't facing the kind of trade barriers they face at the border. Um, it's, and it's everything. Um, it, it's everything from how much more difficult it is for a woman to be able to engage in trading at the border. Um, it's the issue that you know, when women approach the border to try to trade their goods, the chances that they will be experiencing a bribe that is four to 10 times larger than the bribe that a man has to pay, that's what really happens. Many of women are, are less literate in a lot of the world. So they have to read complicated substance forms and fill them out, can't do that. So they, then they get subject to do abuse. Um, it can even be physical abuse. So again, huge issues just for women at the border. Huge issues where in all of the countries in which women do not have the right to own property, do not have the right to open a bank account, cannot engage in, cannot set up their own company without the signature of a man, a husband, a someone else. Huge issues there. Huge issues on tariffs. In the United States, women's underwear carries a higher tariff than men's underwear. Why? Many, many women's items of clothing throughout the world carry a higher tariff than men's, tar than men's clothing. Huge, you know, why? Why? We have huge tariffs in much of the world on women's sanitary products. No, no tariffs on condoms, high tariffs on women's sanitary. Why? So again, a huge effort to try at the WTO to again, use a lot of these trade tools to get at some of these issues. So I'm gonna close by just saying, I am gonna be the optimist. Um, that I think if we can think about a trading system that can take on these kind of issues, climate change, biodiversity, sustainability, food security, supply chain resilience, and that this is doable. We have this WTO and we have trade tools in it. Um, and so the issue is whether we're willing to try to commit ourselves to create the political will and the leadership to pivot the WTO and the, and the rules-based trading system to a system that is fit for the 21st century. So thank you very much.